Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the, the show. Um, back, we've got Barry Littleton. How are you going, Barry? Pretty good. How you doing, Pete? Good, mate. You got the Star Trek badge on. Everyone's loving that. Yeah, Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brings I love- you good luck. Man, I'm weird like that. <laughs> no, I love your personality. Everyone's been commenting and they loved it and just laughing. You bring just great energy to what's going on. Now, what I have to say, and I just said to you, I've had more comments about you than any other guest. Um, and as I've said to you, um, to me, it's just like Michael Lee Hill having people like that on or Susan Kornacki where... I'm being activated more than when I'm talking to you. There's this shit going on on another level that just is bang, bang. It's just all these light code activations and, and doors opening in my mind where the knowledge is, but things are happening because I'm t- being taken to the next level and so are those who are watching it and they're watching this stuff for a reason. They've been guided to it. Now, we've had a lot of no. questions brought in, man, and we've, I've got some on my end. Mainly, you've got a heap. Now, those that are following Barry, uh, he, he's he got a heap of questions that were given to him in the Outbox and Facebook, and he's sorry that he hasn't got back earlier. It's just, same with myself, I will get messages sent to me on Facebook, and it's not in my normal message box, it's in the Outbox, and when that happens, you don't usually, or I don't think you get like a number, you know, for the <coughs> messages coming through. So, it's, um, Barry's here to address that. Among yeah, I don't some other topics. To get back to, uh, I had just found that out the other day, and there were a bunch of messages in there. And uh, I want to say thanks to everybody. I've just only started talking with the influence of people like you, Peter. And uh, I had no idea that it would impact people like that. And I really appreciate the reinforcement and the things that have been said. So I want to say thank you and hello to everybody. Yeah, no worries, mate. And, and thank you. I, I enjoy talking to you, having you on, and just our friendship. It, you activate me in a lot of other ways, as, as I've said. And just the other stuff we talk about, just, you know, normal stuff as well, as much as normal can be. Um, <laughs> what, what we'll go into, look, we were talking just a bit before the show. We'll get into the to the questions soon. Because this is brought up, and what usually happens with Barry and myself is spirit takes over during these shows, and it does almost with every guest. You just go on a tangent, not in a bad way. It's just you've got to say what you've got to say because it's just coming in. Now, just before the show, you were talking about the prison planet, um, and we are talk- talking about John Lee with uh, and other people who said it don't go to the light, and then you were talking about the differences between the light, um, and also about cell creating other universes. So, like it, to me, what it was like was the cell of source, which we all are. Once you get to a certain mm-hmm. point, you create other universes yourself. <coughs> once you get to the ascended state. Um, could we start off with the prison planet? Because I feel that this needs to be heard, and you've talked about, you've gone over it before, but the detail you're going in with why, how, and what's going on, and it pisses me off, it pisses you off. Some people don't want to hear it, but this is part of it, and I believe that what you're saying is actually part of the self-mastery lesson experience, albeit a fucked up one. Sorry for the language, everyone, but it is. It's, yes. it's screwed yes. up what's going on. Um, so... If we could probably start in the prison planet with coming back with amnesia, spiritual amnesia, you know, and that type of thing that you're talking about, would you mind going into that for us? Not at all. I think that we have to start really addressing things at first from the spirit level, the soul level, that we are immortal souls. That is the creator's gift to us. Whether it be light, patterns of energy, whatever we are, we are immortal, all right? And here, this is a prison planet. And since my childhood, I've always felt like this is a penial colony, all right? And the reason why I say that is there's great beauty here, all right? We've got ecological beauty. We've got zoological beauty. But the souls here that incarnate here and walk around just like you and me are effed up, man, a lot of them. Out of 10 people, six of them are crooked. And you know it as well as I do. I mean, I can turn on TV and see that they're... Parents murdering their own children, people hurting each other in the name of this and that and destroying things. It, it's horrible. This is a prison planet in that way. And the fact that most of us cannot remember where we came from before we incarnated here is a big problem. We're suffering from spiritual amnesia. And the last time, a couple of uh, episodes, we talked about what, what I call the net, all right? A net, a thing that generates a frequency that we come to when we enter the the solar system and incarnate into our body, all right? And I became aware of this at first. I know that 
my, my star friends had told me about this, but it's hard to remember everything they say, all right? But it started when as a child, I started reading a book, um, The Ringmakers of Saturn. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the large ships that are out there making these rings, they thought. And these things are about mining. 300 back. malls, isn't it? 300 yeah. malls, some of the things yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. and, and that And when you look at it, like we said before, Saturn does look like a, a satellite, does it not? It's mm. very odd. You know, so it starts there. Part of this net is there. They're generating a scalar frequency, all right? And then it goes over to Mars and Sidonia. We don't know what happened to Sidonia in that area. Then it goes to the dark side of the moon and then comes to Earth with their installations right here now that are generating this scalar frequency as well. Ancient monoliths, and I believe what we call Project Harp as well. I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to mend what was already functioning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyway, when we come into the solar system, we get what my understanding is a type of electrical shock, all right, to our soul, all right? And then begins the hypnotic uh, suggestion to remember what we are, remember every, to forget everything, and then we incarnate through the dark side of the moon when we uh, come to Earth. I say that because the first uh, gurus I started studying, like Paramahamsa Yogananda and Sri Yitishwar, they talked about how we incarnated on the dark side of the moon and came through a thing that they called the soul catcher. All right? John I think that... mentioned that as well, and Ingo's talked about the back side of the moon, Ingo Swan, but John Lee has said the same thing, and see, you've got different sources saying the same thing again, and I've actually had similar information from Shiji in the recent book I wrote yeah. in nine hours in nine days recently. So this yeah, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me chime in on that. It's interesting you say that, Pete, because... Um, I correlate the, the soul catcher with what Richard Hoagland calls the shard, which is supposedly 60 feet off the moon uh, on the dark side, and it's eroded because the meteors it's are hitting six it. six kilometers or something, isn't it? Or six miles high? Is yeah, that the yeah, one? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, like six miles, something like that. It's, it's huge, yeah. you know? And something I found interesting is that in your regression, the one you sent me before you made it public, uh, you had said that the moon, although it's still a natural satellite, was under artificial control, and you said it was reptilian. I don't know if you remember that, but that right there... Oh, I can't, I can't remember to, much. Okay. It's, it's been revealed that the, there's another force behind them, but it is under the reptilian control, but there's a force behind them. Well, you know, um, right now, NASA's put some type of something up there trying to, they, they're trying to, to, to do something that they're calling the ring of the moon, and they're saying the moon could possibly have been hollow, they thought. All right, I can't what tell you the information that. I've heard is from Richard Hoagland's own research with data that anyone can check. When they started doing moon landings, there was enough seismographs put onto the moon to sort of get like a mini CAT scan. You could sort mm -hmm. of transfer the inf information to get that. And from these seismographs, it was showing that the, the moon was ringing when things were landing on it, um, sometimes up to an hour. It also showed that there was geometric arc-shaped objects 1,000 miles beneath the moon's surface, which are not... It's basically got to be man-made or something's put it there because that is not natural. They'll arc shape. They had ge geometry to it. Just like Carl Sagan says, you can look at any planet and tell if there's been life there by a regular geometric pattern. And this is what, besides yeah, thought transfer or telethought, the next universal language is geometry. And then also when they've, when they've got the... Um, they've got the things to check for the samples of, I think, a foot underneath the crust of the moon, it was shown yeah. that the moon had been brought from one star to this star, our sun, because it had been exposed mm -hmm. to a different sun a certain amount underneath. So this is NASA's own data. And then, funny enough, around the time this data was released by NASA, that anybody can go and check, the seismographs were turned off, which apparently costed the same amount as um, NASA's coffee for a whole year which is stuff all to run. So this is where there is actual data that NASA have put public that correlate with what you're saying and others have said about the moon uh, being hollow to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. And then we've got regular geometric stuff going on there that should not be there by all intents and purposes with how it's being bombarded by meteorites and particles and everything else. Yes, yes. You know, and things like there's, you know, there's some books out there that are worthy of checking out, like um, Codex Sidonia. Sidonia Codex is the name of that book. And mm -hmm. some of the mathematic, mathematical equations are breaking out 
as far as the structures they're seeing in Cydonia and trying to correlate them to like Egyptian hieroglyphs and things like that is really interesting and on another level altogether. So I'd advise anybody to check that out. Um, the thing is that once we come through this net, and I say this scalar frequency, but I think it's a little more than that. And it's interesting, I keep hearing about electrical charge and that they're electrical shocking our souls to a certain degree. And you know, I find that very interesting because if we look at some of the research that's been nearly obliterated by our society, like Wilhelm Hell Reich and what they called orgone energy, mm -hmm. they noted that there's a problem between electricity and orgone. It's got a destructive type of a, a combustive type of a deal. So that means that our souls are basically life energy, which is going to be more orgone. So electrical charge is going to, we're going to have a problem with that. All right. Then we go through this, the, the amnesia. We get basically hypnotically programmed to forget, okay, what we are, where we come from, that we can even remember anything. And then we incarnate through this soul catcher here on the earth. And we get here, we come here, we're completely, um, oblivious to what we where we've been if we've been here before or anything you might be someone like me that had past life flashes immediately but even for me it was fragmented you know what i mean and that's that's a prison of a type all right the problem is i thought that maybe this just happened when we incarnated here it didn't appear it didn't i don't know i didn't get it that maybe when we're leaving as well when our body is done and our soul starts leaving trying to leave the solar system all right, we hit this net again, and we get when we hit this net again, we get programmed, clean, wiped clean, sent back here to incarnate again for these predators that are down here that are feeding on us that I'm hearing called Archon quite a bit right now. But yeah, well, nonetheless, that's how it keeps on being referred to me. Or now, uh, Satan's recently writing this latest book, The Lower Light, because I'm being mm -hmm. shown everything in a light spectrum, and also yeah. in the net, Shiji's included Jupiter in the net. Yes. Which is yes. what you have, but she has included Jupiter, which I'm not sure. I've actually I've wrote this book nine hours in nine days, and I'm telling Soul I'm tripping out because this is shit that's just blowing my mind. Information. Ask you a question. Has CG mentioned something to you? Um, the fact that some of these installations have been destroyed now. I think some of them have been destroyed. These installations are throughout our solar system. All right, and the, some of them have been destroyed. But the fact that they're using a virtual reality technology, holographic technology, to max the traps themselves has created a problem. So discovering them is problem number one, which is being done, I think, but I think it may not be completely done yet, but enough to where there are other souls starting to incarnate here now that are aware the whole frequency and upgrading of consciousness is happening at a quicker frequency, like a quickening type of yep. a deal. Yeah. There are there are installations that have been in use and are not within the solar system. Also, there are still places within the solar system that are being used and there's stuff going on there from super soldier stuff to people actually being taken and kidnapped from here, taken there, all for the intents and purposes of, of energy for this force. And that's breaking down too because they're realising that they can't evolve even more. What, what, what I'm getting is that these guys were once the Elohim and it's mm. the dark side. Uh -huh. And what happened is when they went into service mode, self-service mode rather than the service mode, they mm. changed their light density, which is why they're now called the lower light. They, they went and That's even, awesome, though, even oh. though they're light type beings, oh. when your Elohim state and we can get to that and actually beyond, because the Elohim are creator beings, what we do is we actually almost become them because we become creator beings later, which you go into in other universes and so so forth. But the, the technology is different. So, for example, if you're the Elohim or Shiji, which she's an offshoot of the Hello, Elohim, which connects from a grid from Sirius to the Pleiades to Orion, yeah. and the Elohim have got different factions in Sirius to Pleiades and Orion, and they're throughout bloody everywhere from what I understand, but there's different factions working in the same light spectrum placed out in different areas but what happens is these archons that once were the yellow hang when they change their light density from service mode to self-service mode what happened was they lost a lot of abilities in terms of the yellow and other beings can create things by thought 
Now, the Archons, because they once were the Elohim, they're still smart, they've got a lot of knowledge, but they had to go to lower forms of technology, which is yes, still yes, way more you. advanced than ours, but yes. they're not working at the same level. And if they re-go back to service mode, they will gain that back. Because people talk about, if we got free energy, we would blow ourselves up. No, you don't get given free energy and let it be happen on a civilization level until you've got a higher level of consciousness. <clears throat> so... Yeah. You, with a high level of consciousness, you get all this stuff because you're in service mode. As soon as you lose that, you lose everything. It goes back to where it is now, and, and you're getting power played again. You know, I, I'm getting this again, so I, I'll bring this up. Mm -hmm. And this is for anyone that is following this field and is having experiences or anything. Definitely look at the work of Dr. Carla Turner, all right? And Dr. Turner, the reason why I bring that up, because it actually in a different way contrasts with my personal experiences all right just one she speaks about a virtual technology virtual reality technology that interestingly enough our society just seemed to leave alone around the 90s outside of making like nintendo and sega and stuff like that but those virtual machines just seem to kind of go away you know but she talks about a technology that the darker forces use to trick people when they're uh, doing abductions and things of that nature. And she wrote a couple of books. One of them is called Masquerading of Angels, just before she mysteriously was got some type of a cancer with her husband and died. Mm. Anyway, um, the reason why I bring this up is because in my second experience that was physical as an adult and I had to be regressed for, um, I was asked questions. You asked, actually asked me about the helmet that came down, and it was uh, over my head, and it was this was a conscious vehicle, all right? When people hear James Gillian talk about conscious vehicles he's seeing out there on his ranch, I've been on board one of those, all right? And trying to have a frame of reference to perceive anything. It's <laughs> very, very, yeah, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's like, man, excuse my, my language, F you, man. You know, how are you going to figure it, it? It's really hard, you know? So the helmet was simple, simply to give me a frame of reference. And they, they called it like a type of virtual reality technology, but they said something. They said this can be also be converted to be very bad. And I know it is. These are the forces of light I'm dealing with. But on the other side, I see exactly what they mean now. And that's the same technology we're dealing with right now that's been used to trick humanity, that's using for these installations to generate a frequency that nullifies our natural psychic abilities and keeps us asleep. I mean, and we know that we've got predators here, just like the natural ecosystem of Earth. Everything we see here is predatorial, all right? On the, on the spirit level, on the universal level, I'm convinced the universe is predatorial. <clears throat> that brings up um, somebody now that was just asking me a question just today or yesterday, and it was concerning Dr. Greer. And when I thought about that, and he said that all the star beings are, are love and light and everything's good and yada, 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 and do you agree with that? Um, I will say openly, no, I do not. My experiences have been all positive, and they've been with a hierarchy of beings that I've told you before what they're called, the Extragalactic Interdimensional Cooperative Alliance. At first, when they told me that, that name, after 36 years of experiences, I said, are you kidding me? I had to tell people that? That sounds worse than Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, but um, nonetheless, my experiences have been positive, but I've talked to too many experiencers now that that's not the case for them, all right? And there's obviously darker forces that are in control of the higher societies of this, this planet that's keeping everything in a, a quagmire here, like what Rupert Sel Sheldrake calls the morphogenic uh, field, which is the intent of all that people are generating. Right now on Earth, it's war, it's hate, it's murder, and there's beings that are feeding on this. Okay, we're cattle in prison. And <clears throat> I think when you look at the fact that you've got, in whatever galactic society we come from, okay, you've got criminals there like you do we are that are perverts, murderers, people that have to, spirits that have to be in prison, all right? Fallen ones for sure, all right? They get imprisoned on a planet, they get wiped clean, and they incarnate somewhere here, a prison planet. But also, in a messed up galactic situation, if we looked at this religiously like a Lucifer rebellion type of thing, all right, you've got these same beings that are creating us to kind of um, have a free will zone 
okay, to be in a zone where we're falling the same way, but they're also exiling the geniuses, the creative geniuses, certain leaders, certain nonconformists, all right, are going to be wiped clean and sent to this prison planet along with the criminals, all right? And thus is where you get people like you and I, people right now that are listening to this, that have incarnated here, that can turn on the 10 o'clock news and see people that have murdered their children, people like Jeffrey Dahmer telling you, uh, 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 I like to eat people, I ate people, and I carried their skulls to my locker because it gave me power over their soul. Listen, and if you let me out of here, I'll do it again. It felt good. That is what we call a demon telling you what it likes, what vibration it likes, what it's going to go back to when its body's no longer functioning. And on this planet, these demons, negative inorganic beings, fallen ones, whatever, can incarnate just like you and I and walk amongst us. That's a problem. So, let me, I'll finish up, I'm sorry. No, but when we no, die, no, 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 people we, are gonna wanna know this and you're probably opening yeah. up more uh, questions for people, so don't worry. <laughs> you know, my, my problem is, Peter, when, I thought we just maybe got wiped clean when we incarnate in. I didn't think that when we when we die and are leaving, we hit this net again. Okay, and I heard like going way back, man, into maybe the early 90s, maybe even 89. I think it was John Lear was the first one. He said, don't go to the light. The light is a trick. Don't go to the light. I've dealt with the light a lot. I found that disconcerting, but the same to token, it had like a thousand rushing waters in my ear of truth, all right? And I knew something was true to what he was saying. Well, I've the heard shows where uh, Art Bell and John Lear talked about this, and it really worried Art Bell because he's like, you know, that's that's pretty hardcore if that's the case. Yeah. John was well, saying that Whitley Strieber had said this to him, and then I heard Whitley yes. asked by Art Bell, and he can't remember saying it, but he did say that doesn't mean he didn't say it. But apparently in a book, he did say later on that he did write something like that in a book, but it was a... Uh, you know how some of his books are. They're not completely fiction or non-fiction. It's a bit of both. But John Lee is convinced there are others that are convinced too. And if they can manipulate, and this is what goes into what you a precursor to what you were talking about before the show, of the different lights, the moon and the sun. Do you want to go into that for everyone? Yes. And, you know, what... what... When I, okay, looking at polarity, we know our creator himself is in polarities, all right? But it's the different in light, like what I can see, okay, and what I'm getting, what I've got, is the different in light of like the moon and the sun, all right? They're two different types of light. The moon has a very cold light. Very few flowers bloom in moonlight, all right? The moonlight is cold as to where the light of the sun is warm. It's got infrared, all these different spectrums. It's a giving, a life-giving light, all right? And that explains why on some of these ships that were the more material ones I was on when I was younger, and they're telling me these engines that are emitting this light, they're calling it the living light, and they're letting people in spirit form, form touch it, all right? They kept calling it the living light. Now I know why, if that makes sense. But the problem is, as immortal spirit beings, all right, as immortal spirit beings, where there are trapped laid out by darker forces for us that are designed to attract us, erase our soul memory, and then incarnate us into something like this, a prison planet, all right? And I think when dealing with that, it's that type of light that attracts us. So when we're leaving the solar system and we've dis we disengaged from our body, the silver cord they talk about is dislodged and we start trying to get out of here, we hit this net, and the way that they trap us is by this cold light, which would be more of a moonlight. The religious people always talk about that Satan is a light bearer because he has light, he's a light being. He would be, that's a super mind, a super angelic being that has fallen. Of course he's going to be light. So this cold light attracts us, and when we go to that, it immediately electrifies us, all right? Then we get hypnotically auto-suggested white clean, saying we can't remember anything. We can't remember we can't remember. But we're going to be sent back there on a special mission. And then we reincarnate here again so we can be food for all these bad situations that occurred out here to be food for these predators that are hunting us. And since we're immortal 
None of us have the first thing. People that have argued with me recently got are mad at me. Like, well, I don't believe in reincarnation. Well, where'd you come from before? Well, I don't know. Well, then you're full of shit. I made a turkey <laughs> stop. <laughs> yeah, you don't know. We may have incarnated again and again and again, and we don't know it. And if we're in a prison situation, it always makes sense to everybody but the prisoners. Anyway, well, this that's... Is, that's this is in, going into inf information that I've got and it's just been wrote in the, in the next book coming out where it so ties into what you've just said in terms of there are those with the higher energy that have done their walk here and got out long ago. They've mastered mm -hmm. the human experience and once you master that, you can ascend if you want. It, there's still that choice. But what, what's happened with a lot of them, they went to the star nations and did their walks there. And they've reincarnated mm -hmm. on other planets and they go back to the star nations and, and it, it keeps cycling over. But then there was those that were trapped here. And what happens is because of this cycle that you were talking about and is exactly what Shady is talking about, it, what it did was it stunted the universe's growth. And the universe, from what I'm understanding now, is a cell of many other cells. Even though we're a cell of the universe, the universe in itself is a cell of what Shiji related to me is super God consciousness, which mm, she said yeah, she yeah. still can't explain to me because I've got no reference, but it's basically all the friggin' other universe is part of some other intelligence. And uh, that everything yeah. going on here, whether it's of a service or self-service mode, it's still of the same light and it's still yourself, yeah. another projection of yourself. And once you see God in all, that's where the self-mastery lesson comes again. And with it here, when... When this energy grid was started, this, this net that you talk about and, and Shiji talks about, and when this uh, reincarnation trap cycle with the soul catcher started, what happened was this stopped beings leaving the, you, leaving the solar system to go and reincarnate in the other planes and dimensions because why we left source in the first place was to gain knowledge and have experiences in all states. And this has stopped that. So this is where the high, high vibrations of people that have got... Uh, had been here, done their walk, they've had to come back because they hold higher energy for the new energies coming in. And the other side of it too is that some came directly from source that hadn't reincarnated before. They were do downloaded programs and some people think they're Jesus or whatever. Some of them are full of shit. Some might actually be because they've been given the program to be able to handle. It's like being at your computer. To do your job, you've got to be given a program. They've been given not just Jesus, but all these different lives because they need <laughs> some reference to be able to handle here. Oh, you've got some people there. <laughs> yeah. So this is where I'm not trying to go too much on a rant, but it's the same sort of stuff that's. And this has only been revealed to me lately, like in, in the last week. So well, well, they've set everything up. They've set everything up. Religions on um, things that keep us warring with each other. You know, one one person over here is saying, "Well, my God said to murder you." Must say, my God said to love you, and no one's understanding. I mean, it, it's craziness. And the worshiping of false idols instead of using the limited 70 years you get here if you're blessed <laughs> to actually <laughs> to use action to actually try to access God consciousness, mm -hmm. God awareness through action, not just talking about it, not just reading about it, through action, you know. And I'll throw something else in there, something we're talking about. I think it's relevant for people that study uh, Toltec things, like Carlos Castaneda and stuff like that. Uh, his teacher, um, Don Juan Mattis, uh, he talked about the eagle, all right, and the eagle being basically universal structure, all right? And he said that when we leave the body and we get out there, the eagle is a predator, and we go in through the beak of the eagle, all right, and he's describing this in a remote view type of way. We go in through the beak of the eagle, and the beak wants our life memories. All right, and they, his religion, those shamans spent a great deal of time doing recapping their life, recapitulation, all right, of their life and bringing all the energy through breathing techniques, bringing the, the energy that we leave with everyone in every situation back to them. And when they die, the beak of the eagle would be satisfied with the recap, with the recap energy and take that and leave their soul energy intact, all right? And the reason why I will speak about this is because I can take this a step further than most people. I died, all right? I suffered 
four catastrophic traumatic injuries that just about took me out of here. And I was out of here, I mean, as far as in and out of consciousness, life, I was in a coma for weeks, you know what I mean? And I passed on the way to the hospital itself, all right? And most of my life, I had done multiple, multiple spiritual techniques. I practiced things, prayed. I mean, I've done it all. Even Ekankar, I've done all the astral body. I've done all that crap, man, all right? And tried to actually do through action to limit things to what skills and techniques actually produced metaphysical and paranormal results. Quick ones. You know what I mean? So I made to limit that, but it was all so that I could maintain awareness when my body quit functioning and I could try to project myself on the love frequency directly to the creator and pass several of these bardo, these astral levels we have to go through. That was my deal. Well, you know, guess what, Peter? When the death force actually hit me, I was unconscious for a long time. And I, when I say this, um, I could see flashes of what happened, but I think the Christian Bible or something like that calls it a sleep of death that comes with death. As a psychologist, I would call that unconsciousness, all right? And for all my great meditation, for all my practices and all the experiences I've had, star beings and otherwise, I was unconscious for a long time, and I can't remember much about what happened. So what I'm throwing out to you is this. I believe I left my body and hit that net, and now I can't remember half of what happened, but only the flash of the near-death experience I had and things like that. But to be out of consciousness for months, weeks in a coma, and then months after that, um, two months after that, if I can remember who I was, I can't remember very little. That's not good. Just I'm throwing that out there, all right? No, and, and, and what it, what comes to mind when you're saying that too is I wonder personally how some of these higher beings and maybe it's a piece of piss for them, but how do they get through that net to come and help us because we've been them and they know this is like, and they, they, you know, that's what I called Operation Star Seed, my, my second last book. It's a freaking operation, but it's not an operation to kill or take over. It's to come here and help break humanity free from what they're a part of. But how do these dudes even get through this frigging net and then get back out on the net, not in just a physical form, but how do we do it on a spiritual form as well? There's got to be something there to how this is done because, as you know, we've got frigging big-ass crafts coming in and out of the sun. We've got them around the moon. I'm filming them here. They're being filmed all over the, the world. And we know that some of these dudes we're interacting with are our crew. We know that. So that, that's where other questions are brought up to me, which I wonder too, is how they're getting through the net. Because if that's what's happened to you on a spiritual level, um, this is pre some pretty advanced shit. Because if it's able to recycle stuff, th th there's even a thing I'll just bring up quickly. There's a book, I forget what it's called, but it's about Mars. And there was some dude that was American that came into Australia and there was a book, two books done and he talks about how he worked out he was a super soldier but they go into how in Pine Gap he um, found out him or it happened to other people they were able to actually capture parts of people's souls and put them in jars or something equivalent to blackmail people so who oh, these man. dudes are oh man you're going, you're going kind of where Carla Turner goes with that now you know she talks about the black boxes that all the experiencers talk about the black boxes that these these grays say they're using to transfer souls from our soul into these copies mm. and in doing away with that. Have you ever read that? That's in the mask. Uh, see, I don't know much about Carl. I've heard of it so many times, and I just haven't been um, – well, has something lead me to a work yet? But I have heard Whitley Strieber talk about the black box. I think it was Whitley talk about it. And that's weird. I've seen a black box in my experiences, but it was for propulsion. It was not yeah, for anything yeah. like that. Um, but, uh, that, you know, that, that, I don't know where that begins and ends, but for Carla's work, a lot of, some of the shows like Spielberg, people should always pay attention to everything he does. All right. But Spielberg's Taken, which was a mini series on sci-fi about maybe seven episodes that no one seems to hardly remember. People should really pay attention to that. That was based on Carla Turner's work. Trippy, anyway, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh. It's just a matter of, I think that as far as getting through the net, I will once again take that to one of my regressions that came out. They're showing me our understanding of wormholes, not just big ones, but small ones, micro wormholes, all right? 
And I described people before when dealing with the, how these the ships I've been on, how some of them are built, are not just the quasi crystals and the metals that are refined from uh, planets that don't have Van Allen belts, but then they take this metamaterial, this combination, and they grow it over a singularity in deep space. But this singularity is what our science now calls micro wormholes. And I know they exist because that conscious craft we just talked about, as in James Gillian White ways that I was on, there was the bridge of it was actually micro wormholes itself. Well, that now, might ex- like- no, that might explain something because lately the information I've got, again, because there's just been so, people have got no idea what I've been through in the last two weeks, but this is mental, but this goes into what you're saying, and now I might have a scientific understanding for it. Once you get to a certain state, they reckon you can break down to basically a particle of energy, teleport, like you know how two particles on the other side of the universe could know the exact same thing, even though they're separated. You could turn into a particle. From there, you can teleport where you want, and then you can re-basically build yourself, your energy back up, and then appear wherever you want. So like you're right now, I'm I'm all this energy. Energy in physical matter, I break down to one light particle, teleport where the hell I want, and then bang, reform myself. And this is not, it's like Star Trek, but it's without technology, it's by thought. Because once you get to a certain level of consciousness, you know how to manipulate. Do you remember the particle beaming that I posted from the Anderson Institute? One of the ways of time travel they describe, it looks similar to a Star Trek beaming someone out, but it's actually particle beams for time travel and travel whatsoever but i'll tell you on a lighter note man we need to be careful with that because you remember old jeff goldblum don't you the fly uh brundle dash fly you know what happened to him? <laughs> <laughs> so, to be very anyway. careful <laughs> but yeah um man that's uh i, I could dig that though because I that could, could that could almost be you were creating not not only only do they exist, you could actually create that, or if you knew how to break yourself down, you could use a micro wormhole to pop out mm-hmm. wherever you want. Well, you know, I was I was on this ship, and when I'm, you know, you talk about having a frame of reference. Thank God they put that helmet on me for a little while and took it off. <laughs> I always would have thrown up the whole time, like most of the physical experiences. I'm sorry, when someone tells me, oh, I was on this craft, they took me out to Andromeda, we came back, and I was standing there. No, you weren't. You weren't doing it physically. <laughs> Not on the ships like I've been on. That's impossible. You'd be dead. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I'm on these crafts, and, man, I'm about to pass out all the time, I'm about to throw up all the time. And I never never did understand why, when I was a child, I hated merry-go-rounds, the way they make you feel, and that's why. It feels like being on a ship. Yeah. Very much so, you know? Just, just <laughs> the density and everything there. What we'll do now, we'll go, we'll go into some more stuff soon, but would Ooh. you mind addressing some of the questions? Uh, have you got some of the questions there? I've got a couple here uh, that, that were addressed to me, but would what would you like to do? How would you like to go uh, about this? One, one, there's a really nice lady. Uh, Sylvia, is it? Yeah. In the, yep. is, oh, really cool. I, I appreciate her a lot. Um, she asked, a question, asked me a question about Moldavite. She said that I'd spoke about some of the quasi-crystals on the ships before, and if I could go into that a little bit. Um, Moldavite. Moldavite there. Oh, that's a nice wrap on that. Yeah, I've got is that, is that a orgone? Is that an orgone wrap on that? Orgone pendant with uh, with that? I don't. It was just one of those spirals you can put it in that, that I bought from a shop race. This no joke. I went with Lee Kerr to I think it was called Equilibrium in Melbourne. It's a pretty decent size piece. I've got another one here. What's uh, what's funny is we knew this. Was, Sol was telling me not to get it that she could get it for me somewhere else. But she knew I was going to get. The, I walked in the shop and I held this, and my third eye just went bloody ballistic. But what's even funny is a few months be- oh, well, at the start of the year when I was bringing out my book Breaking Free, um, I got told to put a spiral on the cover and then I went and got ordered some Moldavite from a lady. She said she had to get it from the source because it's hard to get where I was in rural Australia. And then she goes, she was guided to make a connecting piece for, for, a, um, for a necklace and it's basically the front cover of my book Breaking Free with the spiral, um, yeah. which is trippy. So, but that's what that's Moldavite not. looks like, people. Anyway, There's, that's a see-through bit, but uh, even got another bit here that's a bit. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice piece there. Notice how that one's di- slightly different texture. It's a little different, little darker than little the other. D- piece. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
Um, yeah, so so address motorbike, mate. Okay, well, I know the, the, what I know about it was limited, uh, but um, it vibrates. I've worked with it a few times. It vibrates to numbers two and six, all right? And what I've had a habit of doing is taking magnets and kind of placing some magnets on it to kind of alter the magnetic frequency and the magnetic uh, structure of it slightly, and it does, it becomes slightly more telepathic at that point. Um, of the meteorites I've worked with, it's the strongest, and it might be because of the way it impacted there in Moldavia, and I understand when it impacted and went back up, the heat that went up almost went partially out of the atmosphere and came back down and heated it, and that's what gave us that techite. It's the strongest techite I've dealt with. Um, after my experiences, all right, uh, something that was unique about these quasi-crystals that I witnessed, which are not just what the small, smaller quasi-crystals they make a combination to make men, men material for the skin of the ship, but I've seen ones I described before that were actually propulsion, that they described they were big, though. These things are about, man, maybe nine feet tall, three feet wide, three of them, and they're they're vibrating. And what's interesting when I look at that is that they had, I've told you before, a type of copper wrap. It looked like copper wrap on them. They look quite similar to that in a spiral type one? of wrap. No, the other one. The other one. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That, this one, yeah, yeah. Bingo, bingo. But they're wrapped a little tighter on that. And when they start actually spinning, all right, they start making this hum. And it's a hum that um, it sounds like a low bass, all right, quite similar to the sound that if the doggone shaman gets on that rock once a year and he's got that beetle that's attached to that uh, the chain and he swings it, woo, 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 woo. He, the sound sounds a lot like that, all right? And my being, my friend there told me that that was not just used to power motherships, but it could power planets also, all right? And also that that sound I was hearing, that vibration heals human flesh and also astral, people astrally as well, yeah. all right? So that's one thing there. But anyway, as far as these quasi-crystals I've seen, they emit a light, a chemical or bioluminescence from the inside. No crystals here do that, all right? including the ones I just described. They're glowing from the inside. So this is a type of thing similar but not the same. as You know how there's fish in the ocean that glow green under – they've got like bioluminescence. Yes. Well, that's what you just said, wasn't it? It's not I, like that but similar to how the crystal does it from I the think inside? It's, I think it's quite the same All because right, yeah. I, think, I think it's worth noting that during one of these physical experiences I had, actually, geez, this keeps coming up. The one with the the the, the um, conscious craft. Okay, on the way out to our spot, we could see this thing out there. All right. By the time we pulled up there, it's suddenly gone. I was so excited. By the time I get pulled up and everything, maybe I can finally make this contact happen. Because after we had the first one with missing time, we tried to create another contact experience, and it didn't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when it finally did happen, it was involuntary. But when we pull up out there, the ship is gone. Oh my God! What the hell happened to him? You know. But something else happened. It was the time of year. This is out way out in the country, but the fireflies, okay, yeah, were yeah, out. Yeah. And you know that the only the fem the males fly. The females can't fly, so they just go up in the trees. But these trees are pulsating. Woom, 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 woom. There are males all over the place flying. I mean, literally, Peter, thousands of them, all right? Then the contact experience happened just after that. And even my regression that came out, I'm saying, well, maybe this is just a firefly thing this time. No, the fireflies are aware of the light ships, period. There's a connection. We really don't know what they are. And I can't create my own bioluminescence. I'm trying right now. Did I glow? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. It's just You're all right. but, you need to bring but, some but, sense but to you say that they're just, Yeah, yeah. To say that they're doing it just to, for mating signals, is incorrect. Yeah. You know what I mean, in my opinion. But I know that they're in some way or another aware of the light beings as well. As well, when I saw what um, Soul likes to call what I, we talked about wisps, yeah. which is like the little flashes you see, and after you, when you shut your internal dialogue outside in the country, you might see them, and you think it's a firefly or something. They're really quick, but you look up. Well, gosh, it's the middle of January. It can't be a firefly, yeah. but they're really quick and they go out quick. That's why. You know what I mean? They're they're and rather. It's it's a light a light frequency thing. You know what I mean? I just didn't understand it at that time. So interesting. Um, is there any more questions from us, uh, Sylvia or Sylvie? 
Um, she asked a little bit. Oh, she asked about uh, the comet that uh, I think yes. it's common. Comet Feely, that they're trying to put, Comet 67 feet, they're trying to put that thing they're calling Feely on. And it's interesting, on NPR today, I just heard them, Rush is talking about putting a couple of satellites they're putting on uh, an asteroid, all right? Putting satellites on an asteroid. Yeah, some type of an automatic robot on a satellite to grab specimens and send them back here. Look, very bad, man. Very, very bad. Anyone listening to this can get on the internet and look up, um, it's called Stardust at Home, all right? If you look up Stardust at Home, it's like the University of Berkeley that has one of those collagen buckets that was dumped back to Earth that has uh, bacteria in it from space that they've been doing experiments on. But you can uh, try to find a, a track, they call it a dust track, that looks different than any other. You identify it, you can have it named behind you, actually. What I'm going to throw out is this, all right? Recently, science has come up with a, another life form here on Earth called, they're calling, calling it a tardigrade, T-A-R-D-A-G-R-A-D-E. It's been nicknamed a water bear, okay? Anyone that likes Doctor Who, it sounds like the TARDIS, tardigrade. Anyway, they found out that when it goes into a natural uh, animated suspension, all right, um, almost uh, cryogenic-like, um, and it can actually travel interstellar. It's capable of with, with, with do, enduring cosmic rays and things like that, but it would be an interstellar traveler. It's capable of this, all right? Now, I'm going to throw this out. What we're dealing with is sentient species. It doesn't matter if it's on the micro, the macro for us. It's no different than how a blue whale, a blue whale lives on plankton. That plankton could be sentient. We don't know. It's micro, all right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. In that, in that way, all right, these tardigrades, these, these space organisms, all right, we're sending out probes out there, and we're getting buckets of them, millions of them, bringing them back to Earth for torture and exp experimentation. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're a sentient being... And on one of our continents, something comes down and scoops up, oh, about 10,000 people and takes them away. They're gone. And you know they're getting tortured. Is that not interstellar war? Is that not war? Well, it, it would, if, even if, though if, the, the people taking them away might be unknown, unknown to what they're doing, it still is an act because it's... Still We're not looking at the connectivity, what the astronauts are saying when they're out there, how everything's connected when you're outside of Earth, all right? And these are a sentient species. You're taking family members. You're experimenting on them. You're, you're going out there to mine more things that are not yours, all right? That constitutes war. And when I say that, I'm saying that there's been a war going on sometime on this planet with space organisms. And I think we need to start looking at things like... Um, Maybe the com trails they're making, what they're really about. What are they trying to get rid of? Okay. okay. Number two, things that crop up like crop up like mad cow disease, mad deer disease. That's and these things that come up suddenly. Oh, swine flu. No one talks about it anymore. They just seem to disappear. All right. The red rain. You're familiar with that. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and it's yeah. very weird that you are bringing this up too in a good way because. Uh, again, I did hear John Lear talk. There was an episode between John Lear and Richard C. Hoagland on Mining on the Moon. And what it was funny is I think from a UN mandate or some shit like that, no country could own any part of the moon or the solar system, but it didn't say anything about people. Now, there was three guys. One of them was named Kramer, I think. You, there's the, the episode's out there. What's funny is that three guys apparently and it was referenced in the show, owned the souls, the mining rights to the whole solar system, and they th these two of the three dudes are meant to own half, which they didn't learn until the middle of the show when somebody, um, or Lex, who was working on the computer, found out this out from research. And then if we're going to other... Uh, and, and you're exactly right. What would happen if some country, if Australia went to America or vice versa, and you came here without any rights in your mind here, it's an act of, it would be an act of disrespect, act of war. And then if there was something living within that, 
Uh-huh. And especially if we're dealing with the collective consciousness. Collective, yes. You know what I mean? Yes, and that's that's what it would be out there. And I, you know, it worries me the fact that we're right now trying to go out there and mine more things that are not ours. We're destroying our own planet. And I'm sorry, but you and I both know there are forces out there that are not going to allow much of that to go on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's not going to be a whole lot of mining we're going to do out there and get away with it. And right now, I think we've created a war out there, and there are things coming in here. What Spirit kept telling me is that asteroid that came into Russia that was about to crash into things. Interesting how it keeps coming to that place. But remember, that was that about a year ago? And then we see that what looks like another asteroid come in and hits it before it can impact, yeah. so it just exploded. That was no coincidence. There was something else sent there. We talked before about the humans that exist here that are brought up off planet, I think out of galaxy, and they're brought back here, all right, and they're here doing work. But they're in seek, they're, 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 they're in hiding right now, but they have access to alliance that I'm talking about technology, hierarchy technology, and we've seen it. It comes off and it creates a virtual reality technology that can apparently be like, looks like a plasma ball most of the time, I believe. Or they can make them look like ships as well. You know, so I don't know. And I think that these beings, these humans, are some of the first that will help us to rebuild if the natural cataclysms get real bad, yep. which we're close to now. Our sun is reacting to us. We keep talking well, about that. Well, that's similar information to what I've got in terms of some will be staying and they're here to help pave the way for which way this, who's left want to go about a lot of things. And that's not just on a, uh, I would say, vibrational level, but the the level of 3D that people didn't ascend to the next sort of new earth or, or whatever people want to call it, which is a complicated thing I've yeah. brought up much on here yeah. and with you too. What's some of the other questions people are asking that you've been sent directly that you'd like to address, Barry? Uh, real, real quick, I think she asked about the organic matter. They're talking about mining from there. Mm-hmm. When I when I read that and the organic matter, I think maybe check out the Uranta book and what they call the life carriers. And it's never really quite described what the life carriers look like, but I think maybe that might be a little more correlated there. Right. Um, okay, uh, other stuff. Um, somebody asked me a little bit about um, Planet X when I thought about Planet X and about uh, Sitchin's work. Sitchin's work was brilliant, but I don't agree with it all, all right? I think that his interpretation was too much based strictly on Sumerian things and alleviating too much ancient African things and other cultures, all right? But when I was a kid, all right, my friends, when I'm obsessively telling him, especially my um, insectoid friend, where are you from? Where are you from? So they're not hurting me. So the next question is, where are you from? Who are you? And he says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't fit your parameters for life anymore. All right. And he said, you should focus on our bases on the third and fourth planets beyond Pluto. And even as a kid, man, I knew there are no planets beyond Pluto. That's like in 78, 79. You know what I mean? I, and there was, he said, that doesn't matter either. Because the technology you have can't detect them yet. Yep. And that sounds like they never lied to me, right, about anything. But it sounds like crap until around 2002 they discover things that they there's another Kuiper belt outside of Pluto, and they have trans-Neptunian objects is what they call them. And three of them, or maybe four of them, are bigger than Pluto. All right. Some of them are even spherical. Anyone can look this up. I was thinking, oh my God, he already told me about that. You know what I mean? And let alone knowing I've probably been there and can't remember it. So, so do you think memory. one of these could be Nibiru? Ah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I think that maybe we shouldn't be looking so much for a large Jupiter type of planet that's on a ultraviolet uh, spectrum or something like that, a different nano spectrum. I don't think it's that as much as there are multiple objects that have been just out of our technology. Uh-huh. I think that's what's going on here. And I think we need to also look at things that science fiction brings up, things that are called like Bracewell probes. And what are Bracewell Bond probes? A Bracewell probe is similar to the movie um, 2001, A Space Odyssey, the monolith. You remember the monolith? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's very interesting. People should pay attention to that. What that is is an artificial intelligence, robotic, that is sent out, and it normally will remain dormant until a civilization reaches like 
a type one civilization, which we're mm -hmm. close to now, which means we become dependent upon the, the, our, our, our parents' star for energy instead of fossil fuels, yep. all right? Yep. We're close to that now, but when we're on that brink, then this technology makes contact with us, mm -hmm. all right? And that's exactly what was going on in 2001. And when I say that to people, brace well probes, what I have a memory of as past life memories, all right, is that we were once when what's called now the sons of God, which are letter being called Anunnaki, I've seen all sorts of things, but the sons of God, which are immediately called, all right, was a type one civilization dealing with eugenics. The structures are still existing now. We can't explain them, all right? But we're dealing with eugenics. We're dealing with things of that nature. But type one civilization, we would have sent out Bracewell probes, all right? And eventually those Bracewell probes are going to come back. It's not that much unlike V'ger from the original Star Trek, the motion picture. Remember that one? That was Voyager, actually. It came back, but it amassed so much energy that it was different. But we've got objects out in our solar system now. One of them is called 1991 VG. Only person I've heard talk about that is Clifford Stone. He talks about it a lot. Another one is called um, SG-344. Both, all, both of those are like um, what they're calling the Black Knight also. Mm -hmm. These objects in our own solar system that are very close to Earth orbit, almost a moon type of orbit, very close to us, and we don't know what they're doing. NASA's saying, oh, it's just that, it doesn't matter. And weird things like comet sighting, that's why I was watching that one, comet sighting, and I watched Ellen in at first. Mm -hmm. Eventually, one of these probes from Earth is going to come back, but it's ours. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I think maybe the concepts that are presented. Well, if we've done it with friggin, was it Voyager that we sent out in the 60s or whatever, how we had the golden record and, and all that sort of shit, if we've done that, mm -hmm. why wouldn't have this been done whenever? You know, going... And you know, before that, there was Pioneer 10 and 11. Yeah, yeah. 20 years before Voyager. Yeah, and they're, they're out of the helisphere now and gone so out of our solar system. If we've done that, why not? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, why not exactly. exactly. And especially more ones that come back. You know, you've got books like Barbara Marchanique, I think one she calls um, The Living Library. And she's talking about Earth as a living library in terms of the genetic information that is here, biological, ecological. I agree with that. But I agree, I think also this is the prison planet. And I think maybe the library was sent out of here and might return, if that makes sense. Yep, yep. Either way. But something's got to happen to stop this destruction of humanity if something doesn't change here quickly we're going to annihilate ourselves we don't need aliens to come in here and do it <laughs> it's these demons that are walking around in bodies like us that are doing it right now yeah. and they're feeding their masters the higher ones gone up we're, yeah. we're cattle man and that's what's going on right now but unfortunately any ranch situation you've got what four or five ranchers and you've got several hundred cattle if those cattle become self-aware and sentient, those ranchers got a big problem on their hands. I think that's what we're seeing right now that amounts to uh, a last feast, maybe. And another one of my regressions... You'd have to um, go Rambo on their asses and get out the, <laughs> the automatics yeah. and... Moo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got to do something. So. It was interesting. One of my later regressions... Um, my guys, they had showed me micro wormholes, and they were saying how prevalent they are on Earth, and how these negatives can actually are using these micro wormholes to manifest through the pineal glands of people. How they start off as negative thought forms first, and that's how they get their stargate to get through to here. Okay, but it's through us, and they start talking about these micro wormholes that are natural to Earth and how they were having problems sealing them all off because they're, what do you call it, they're not stable, they're all over. But they're, they, they talked about, I couldn't understand it at first, a white wall, a white wall that exists behind that they create that stops the negatives from coming through. Now, I kind of take that to what um, Rudy Shields and them were calling quantum holograms, mm -hmm. and kind of the Mako is what he calls it, when the Mako is the, when you come through the, the uh, the hole itself, the, the um, aperture, when you come through it, it creates a copy also. And that's why, like, a lot of the ships we're seeing, all of a sudden you've got one ship there, plating craft or whatever, 
Then suddenly there's two, and then one's gone. Looks like it's jumped to light speed, and the other one's just there. They're the same one, and one of them is the copy before it goes through the quantum hologram, the mecha before it goes through the, the fissure itself. Makes sense? Yeah. But I, I think they're using us to manifest, and that's the problem. That's the, that's the stargate that's not been closed off to the negatives. Fuck, it's that's us. the same shit, man. Fuck, yeah. Folks. That's yeah, the big shit. Like, yeah, and you know, I, uh, I'm not trying to upset anyone. I'm not saying anything <laughs> goes right. I might move to everything, right? I can tell you, I've had some damn weird experiences in my whole life, and some knowledge has been given to me, and I can only try to make sense of it. That's all you we know can what I mean? do. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. What else is there that you would like to address? Um, man, I think I think that's that's. I only wrote down like two or three of them. They they came in so quick that I didn't. Uh, oh, quasi crystals. Um, something interesting about that all right um the charters i was asked a little bit about that we talked in depth about the charters I, I don't know who they are but what's interesting is i think it's giles or somebody like that one of your friends was telling me a lot about how many experiencers free has dealt with that talk, talk about being in bookshops or somewhere like that and being approached by a man that knows things about him somebody said also that they were in i think maybe that was sylvia again she said that somebody approached her and said the on and not the Ihalim are the Anunnaki, Anunnaki are the Ihalim. That goes back been, to what you just said. Michael's yeah, been goes, saying the same thing too, and Michael says they're from Sirius, and I'll, basically he's right, but there's more than that, which I was saying and I've been shown. They're, well, Shiji's an offshoot. They're yeah. The ones I'm interacting with are behind the belt in Orion. He's interacting mm-hmm. with the Syrian ones, and then what I get is there's ones even in, in Andromeda. Mm-hmm. So this mm-hmm. is what it's showing to me, and now... All also reading Keys of Enoch, I'm understanding the energy grid and how these dudes are spread out everywhere. I'm getting that Shiji, Shiji's the gatekeeper of the star Marope, right? So the stars are portals. Metatron, who I had an experience with over a year ago now, which I, I, I was even laughing about it, then I've heard others in the group that's... So just for those, I can talk to you about this off air, that I also had experiences with Metatron. What I'm learning now is he's the overseer of all these portals. He's the one who's like a mega gatekeeper that checks in with the other gatekeepers, but each portal doesn't only just have a gatekeeper. There is ancient spirits here in Australia where there would be Aboriginals and Native American Indians that are at these portals, ancient Tibetans, that work with council-type greys, which are white. Um, and they're the guardians that work with Metatron, but they're not your typical greys. Some of them that I've seen, they've basically got human bodies, except for the private parts, but they've got sort of muscular arms, they're stocky like us, you know, stocky and tall, and then they've got the the head and the big eyes, but they're friggin' white. Um, I witnessed these on the property up in Queensland, which before, when I moved up there, who texted me a friggin' picture of Agnes Water? You did! saying that this area was a friggin' portal, and then everyone else there tells me it's a friggin' portal, and then I find out it's connected to Ayers Rock, which is in the guts of Australia, which is very sacred to the Aboriginals. And so all this shit hooks up, and then I've met people who have had experiences with Metatron there also. So what's this confirmation for me that Metatron's at the portals? He doesn't even have to go anywhere. He is there because he's all at everything at once because he is the guardian gatekeeper. Supreme of them all. Don't forget, my one my one family member that's had a couple experiences beside me said that he was on this ship, and suddenly he's standing in front of these portals on this ship, and one of them is Aboriginal people walking up. And he said he chose to go through that one, and he was in Australia. And he's walking with other experiencers, though. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The whole time. And he kept saying over and over, he said, um, man, they've got to know those Aborigines. He's got to know those that portals there. Mm. They're coming up with looking at it. He said, I was looking at the guy from the other side of it, and he's looking at me. And there's going like that, and, like, and when I came through, they're going like, you know, like maybe I wasn't supposed to or something. As so soon as very- I got out of a car up there where I was living, there was an Aboriginal spirit straight as soon as I got out of the car. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was telling Giles about this, and I had experiences with different types of Bigfoot there that were projecting in my third eye. Just mm-hmm. out, a vibration out of our vibration, and it was beautiful land. But these dudes had red eyes, and instead it was hair, but the hairs looked like sticks. And then I've been shown pictures since then of what the Aboriginals have drew of some of the Bigfoots, and it's exactly what I've seen. Exactly what I've seen. 
Like with you the cartoonish I mean? type effect, but it's exactly what I've interacted you know, with. You know, that 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 goes to what I heard about Linda Moulton Howe, and I, I advise anyone to follow Earth Files and what she's doing. Yeah. She's brilliant, and she does everything factual. But she kept talking about these uh, ranchers and farmers who were seeing these craft over their craft, and suddenly there would be a flash of light, and there'd be a couple of extraterrestrials walking with equipment, and they appear to be uh, Asian of Asian descent, and then there'll be a flash of light after that, and there'll be two Bigfoot, or Yowies, I think you yeah. call them, walking, uh, but they're blonde, albinos, blonde Sasquatches. I never heard of that, all right? Now, I'll do another plug for this dude because he's bad. On YouTube, Thinker Thunker, Thinker, T-H-U-N-K-E-R, Thinker Thunker, put that in with Bigfoot, and pull up that guy's videos. He's got about 10 of them. You've seen a few of them yep. that he's done. That are Some of the ones I thought were fakes. He's using to try to do the CGI. He's doing all that. Yep. Do, he's do analyzing them in a pretty decent way. Yeah, in a real good way. And one of them he's got on there is a blonde Sasquatch. And they're calling it albino. But they get up on the face of it, and it's one somebody found. It turns around and takes off. Look at that one. But I found that interesting when I started going into Native American lore about the blonde Sasquatches albinos they're slightly different so you know it's just it's food for thought at the very least yeah you know what i mean yeah definitely definitely <laughs> what we'll do at the moment we'll disrupt this up because i'm gonna have to get you back on again okay, okay. and i feel like i've not addressed anybody's questions yeah. like i'm supposed to but anybody sends them to me again i promise i'll be happy to well, th- what we've talked about is going to open up a lot more and you'll you're going to get questions continuously anyway and people are finding more and more out about you you and me are always having more and more stuff tie up and connect. And it, as I said, you activate a lot of people in different ways just by them watching and listening to the show. So I thank you for that. I thank you for being a friend. And we've got to keep in contact. I'll get you back on soon. And anything that pops up that you would like to address, just hit me up and we'll, we'll get it out there because there's a lot of information flooding in at the moment. There's a hell of a lot of sightings going on. There's lots of energetic changes which are, which are making the weather go all weird and we're earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, everything's changing at the moment. So there's lots going on and the network's not liking it, which, you know, have the, have the net going on around us. But mm-hmm. anything, just hit me up, mate, anytime. You got it. You got it. Thank you. And I thank everybody else. And I want to throw out a uh, shout-out to uh, Susan K. Uh, I'm a fan of hers. I heard she's going to do a, a show. That'll be cool. <laughs> yeah, she'll be on Wednesday. So it'll be uh, great to hook up with her again and just see what's been happening in her world. Cool. Excellent. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you very much, my friend. I cool. appreciate you getting me to talk a little bit. and um, It's a blessing I can help anyone instead of hiding. It's been really Yeah, cool. no, we'll straight back. It's a blessing having you on, having you as a mate, and we all thank you for, for talking and having the guts to do so and sharing your experiences. My pleasure. My pleasure. God bless everyone. Cheers, mate. Bye. <laughs>